So that's the irony here that's taking place in the story of the Annunciation, that God is going to fulfill his promises to the house of David, but he's going to do it in a really unexpected way. He's going to come to this poor man, Joseph, and his virgin bride, and through them he's going to fulfill the promises that he had once made to David. And you see that in the next part of Gabriel's announcement. When you look at um, Gabriel's annunciation to Mary, four elements of what Gabriel says stands out. He says, number one, that Mary's child will be great. Number two, that the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. That's really important. Another explicitly Davidic allusion there. Uh, number three, he'll be called son of the Most High. And then number four, of his kingdom, there will be no end. Now, those four elements, um, his greatness, the throne, his identity as son of God, and his everlasting kingdom, those four elements of Gabriel's announcement here are allusions, they are actually quotations almost, from a prophecy that was made to David in the Old Testament in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 7, which just so happens to be the first reading for this Sunday. So if you turn back to the Old Testament for just a minute, look at the first reading for the fourth Sunday of Advent. It's from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 and following. Now before I read it, let me just put this in context. Um, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, David has brought the Ark of the Covenant up to Jerusalem because the center of his kingdom is going to be the worship of God. That's why David's a man after God's own heart. It's not because he's never sinned. He's going to eventually go on to sin later in the book of Samuel. But the reason he's such a special king is because he wants God to be at the center of his kingdom. And so in 2 Samuel chapter 7, David looks at the fact that he has this great palace and he decides, I want to build something more than just the tabernacle for the Ark of the Covenant. I want to build a temple. I want to make a house for God to dwell in so that I can give him the glory that he rightly deserves. And so in response to that, this is what we read in the first reading for this fourth Sunday of Advent. Now when the king, meaning David, dwelt in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies round about, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. That means the tabernacle. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? And then it skips down a few more verses and says, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I've been with you wherever you went and have cut off your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name like the name of the great ones of the earth. I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from your enemies. And here's the key verses. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. All right, we'll pause there. Notice the four elements I highlighted from the Annunciation. David's offspring, his dynasty, is going to be great. His descendants will be great, number one. Number two, he will establish the throne of David's kingdom, right? Which, remember, the, the throne is always a symbol for the king's authority, right? Uh, it's kind of like a permanent symbol for the fact that he rules over the people. Uh, number three, and this is really striking, God describes the offspring of David as his own son. I will be his father and he will be my son. Okay? This is the first time in the Old Testament any individual person is explicitly designated as a son of God. Before this point, um, Israel is called the son of God in Exodus chapter 4. You know, Israel is my firstborn son, let my people go. 
but they're referred to as the Son of God in a kind of collective sense. But here, the individual king, the offspring of David, the heir to David's throne, is called the Son of God in the individual sense. Right? He's going to be the adopted Son of God. Uh, so every king after David would be called Son of God uh, whenever they would receive the throne and receive the kingship. And then finally, number four, and this might be the most important one in some ways because it's the most problematic one, God swears, he promises to David that his kingdom and his house will stand not just for a long time or for a thousand years or for uh, two thousand years, but forever. So it's an everlasting kingdom that God promises to David. So why is that important? Well, those four elements we see are reflected in the, in the Annunciation of Mary. So what's going on is Gabriel is deliberately pronouncing the fulfillment of the promise that was made to David as now taking place through Christ. That's the first point. The second point, though, is that the reason that that has to happen is because of the history of Israel. Now, we might not be as familiar with this if you're Christians living in the modern day. A lot of times we're not as uh, knowledgeable about the Old Testament as we could be. But ancient Jews would have known the history of David's kingdom. And they would have seen the problem with the history of David's kingdom. And it's this. Although God promised David through Nathan around 1000 BC that David's throne and his kingdom would last forever, the reality was that David's throne and his kingdom fell apart in just a few hundred years. And this is how it goes. Around 1000 BC, God promises David an everlasting kingdom. Then by 922 BC, when Solomon dies, the kingdom splits in two. So in less than a century, the kingdom ends up divided. And the ten northern tribes break away. Those are called the kingdom of Israel, or the northern kingdom. And then the two southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin, they stay with David's successor. They stay with the rightful Davidic king and with the temple. But now you've got a split monarchy. You've got a divided kingdom instead of the United Kingdom. Uh, within a couple hundred years, by 722 BC, the ten northern tribes of, of Israel, that northern kingdom, are decimated by the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians come in and they, they destroy and they wipe out and they conquer the ten northern tribes and then they take them into exile in what scholars call the Assyrian exile. Uh, then, less than a couple centuries later, in 587 BC, the two remaining tribes, Judah and Benjamin, are also taken into exile by the Babylonians. The Babylonian Empire comes, they destroy the temple, they burn Jerusalem to the ground, and they, they, uh, they slaughter uh, the Israelite king and some of his descendants. Um, they gouge out his eyes right after killing his sons so that the last thing that he would see would be the death of his sons. And then they take him and they bring him into exile and they make slaves of them, basically. So, in other words, by the time you get to 587 B.C., uh, which is a long time, you know, it's a few centuries later, but it's not forever, right? What has happened to the promise of God? What has happened to God's promise to David that his kingdom and his throne and his, his, his heir would always be in power? Well, it looks like God has broken his promise. It looks as if God's promises to David have failed, right? And that... Um, the kingdom is basically destroyed and never going to rise again. And that's really the situation from 587 B.C. all the way down to the time of Christ, right, who begins his public ministry around 30 A.D. in the first century. From those, for all those hundreds of years, the Davidic kingdom is no more. Now, to be sure, around 538 B.C., uh, some of the, the Jews and the Levites they come back from Babylon in what's called the return from exile, and they rebuild the temple, and they rebuild Jerusalem, right, um, in, the, in what's called the Babylonian, um, the end of the Babylonian captivity. But they never restore the Davidic monarchy. They never restore the Davidic kingship, and they certainly never restore the united Davidic kingdom. Because for all those centuries, although the two tribes came back from exile, what happened to the greater part of the ten tribes? still scattered amongst the Gentile nations. They're lost. This is where you get the legend of the lost tribes of Israel. Whenever I'm teaching this to my students, in order to give an analogy with this, 
I like to just use the 13 colonies of the, of the of United States, right? It would be as if Canada or some other foreign power came in and conquered 10 or 11 out of the original 13 colonies of the United States. What would that have done to the Union at that point? Well, I mean, it would just decimate any ability to function as a united um, uh, sovereign power, okay? So the same thing, and same thing's true with Israel. Yes, two of the tribes didn't go into exile, they came back, but they're two of the smallest tribes, Judah and Benjamin. The majority of the kingdom is gone. And that's what it's like all the way down to the first century AD. When an angel comes to a, a virgin in Nazareth who's betrothed to this poor man named Joseph, who, yes, he happens to be part of the royal family, but you wouldn't know it from what he possesses and what he has, and says to that little virgin, you are going to be the mother of the Messiah. You are going to be the mother of the Son of God. His name is going to be great, and he is going to sit on the throne of David, his father. And unlike David's kingdom, which fell apart, his kingdom will last forever and ever. I mean, this is a momentous event. This is what, um, you know, the hopes and fears of all the years, this is what the Jewish people have been waiting for for centuries, that somehow, against all odds, God would keep his promise, and God would restore the kingdom, and God would bring the Messiah, and he would undo everything that had happened with the sin of the people of Israel and the fall of the kingdom of David. And that's what happens to Mary in the Annunciation. She hears that at last the kingdom is going to come, but it's going to come through her and through her son. And the mystery here is that whereas the Davidic kings were called the son of God in a metaphorical sense, or like a covenantal sense, they were adopted as sons of God when they were installed as kings, Mary's child is going to be the actual son of God. He's going to be the eternal son of God. Because God himself is going to divinely fecundate her womb. He's going to fill her womb with life through the power of the Holy Spirit so that the child that will be born will not just be holy, but will be called Son of God in the literal sense. She will actually bear God's Son as King of the world and King of kings and Lord of lords. So um, that's language from Revelation, but you can see how it applies here. Um, so that's, that's the connection between the old and new. I, I think this Sunday, out of all the Sundays of this year in Advent, is really the most striking in terms of how the New Testament is concealed in the old, and the old is revealed in the new, and that the lectionary is deliberately designed to make the old and new come together and come alive for us so that we see what God's doing in, um, in, the, in the good news of the new covenant.